Lord Clonroy had a 20-acre turnip field over the estate wall that marched Drumlana, our wee garden of a farm. The turnips were long since dug by squads of men to feed sheep and bullocks. Twice the mother let me out to cross the wall and glean at night. Each time I came back with a bag of crow-pecked half-frosted roots. The mother fried them with a little pig fat. They were so delicious they made our heads light. Each time in the black dark I could hear the German wolf dogs over a mile away up at the big house. They were kept in a special yard alongside the prize cattle and sheep, penned in every night for fear the gangs of ribbon men would slash their tendons. The third time out, I got braver. There was a moon, and I went a long way from the estate wall out into the middle of the field. I was hoking and gathering rightly when I heard first the chains and then the growling of wolf dogs. They must have smelled me, and for a few seconds of terror, my heart stopped entirely. I could hear a henchman shouting, Go on, go on, get him, boy, get him! I knew that Wishy Mulligan's throat was ripped out by those dogs. Then I was running, as I'd never run in my life, and was over that wall a brave few minutes before the dogs came howling up to where I'd crossed. The fright was bad, but the loss of the turnips was worse. The mother had to hear all and said she'd have near died of shame if one of her daughters was caught clawing like a starved rat in the dark of an empty landlord's turnip field. Ruth McCabe there reading from Tales from the Poor House by Eugene McCabe. Eugene, um, tell me about those pieces, those stories in in Tales from the Poor House, uh, published by the Gallery Press, and uh, quite a quite a remarkable collection. I felt I had to write about it because it's not generally known that for manna. And around this area, the Clonus Poor House was almost on a par with Skibbereen. And the more I read and the more I, more I heard, I thought, I'll try something myself. In fact, people have said I made a mistake in writing short stories, that I should have linked them all together into a novel. But... Um, they are slightly connected in that you hear about one character or another, but it's not a novel. They are short stories. I suppose as well, in a way, it's reflecting the fragmentation of history uh, because sometimes it's, it's hard to, to piece together a, a clear, coherent narrative out of these splintered memories. You're quite right, yeah. It is very, very hard. Did you hear some of those stories from from locals, or was it more from your own research? No, that's research and imagination. Um, the running, the climbing over the wall. Uh, Grace running, you might remember, to get the six princes and all that. That was a very brief f- excerpt that I read in something else in my research. And I made that into something quite big. And I have read that. And it would have been far too long for Ruth to read. Um, But it's a very exciting piece. Yes, the answer is yes. I did pick up things here and there in my reading that were not from my imagination. But they're all tied together with my imagination, you know? Yeah, Yeah. the glue that binds. Yeah. Um, Take me back, Eugene, you, 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 your life in writing. Uh, when, when did you begin to write with, as was a seriousness of literary in, intent? Well, I think around the age of 11, 12, my father told me that they'd never have got through the famine without the Scotch mill. We had a Scotch mill at the home place, Cora Villa. And um, I suppose people brought flax along and they were paid money for it, which was a very big thing. And there was a seven boys, that sounds a bit odd I know, and two girls, and they all had to leave at 14. They understood this, out into the world, and the girls got till they were 18 into service. That's the way it worked. And um, the house, unfortunately, has fallen in now. But that story of getting through the famine was one of the things that initiated the stories that I wrote. 
I was aware that it was also in Cavan. And was that, that sense of, of history in the landscape one of the things that sparked you into writing in general? Well, the landscape has a lot to do. I think if you, and as you have read Death and Nightingales and the stories and that, the landscape plays a huge part in the, it's almost as big a part as the characters. Um, and that is why it's, it's, it's the quotation that you mentioned from Camus, you know, uh, which I can't just remember off by heart. Uh, it was the, the quotation you had, um, you used in yeah. for Heaven Lies About Us, which is, yeah. if there is a sin against life, it is not perhaps so much to despair of life as to hope for another life and to lose sight of the implacable grandeur of this one. Of this one. And, this is, and, and for me, that's landscape. How does Keats begin his poem? Truth is beauty, beauty is truth. That is all we know or need to know. Yeah. And it is the, the beauty of landscape. And we, it's, Monaghan is not unsung because of, pa of Patrick Kavanagh, but I have set all, nearly all my writing in Fermanagh. And Fermanagh is even more unsung, even though it has these fabulous lakes and islands and Rather nice, rather lovely, beautiful Drumlin landscape, not unlike Monaghan, but it's not celebrated. And of course, you're you're within a stone's throw. Well, my father, man. my father was born under a place called Carn Rock. Carn Rock is four miles from here, and uh, he kept that cottage on, literally and handed it over to my mother. And the last thing she said before she died was, you will never, ever sell Cranny, Eugene, will you? That's the real home place. Not this place. It was bought because Hitler was marching all over Europe. And my father was absolutely certain they were going to take over Ireland. And he thought they can take over the house, the officers and all the rest of it, but they can't take the land. The land will be there after they're gone. That was this. Which is how I come to be here. I didn't, I, I didn't earn this through the sweat of my brow. Of course I didn't, or through the reardons, you know. And your father had come back from, from Glasgow? He was a publican in Glasgow and he then became a hotelier and then a picture house owner and he was involved in all kinds of business. And he retired when he married at 43. So he did rather well for himself. And he married an only, an, only, an only child, my mother, and her father was quite well off. So between the two of them, there was no trouble with money ever. Which must have made for a certain comfort in one way, and I suppose sometimes maybe money brings the potential for discomfort as well, or a certain unease around... Well, it allowed me, I remember my mother saying to me that she never looked at anything except religious knowledge on the report. The rest of it didn't matter, as long as your religious knowledge is good. And it was always five, like, you know. I think everybody in the school got five, because we were all daily mass wars, we had to be, you know. Um, and what did you had? What was it? Four, four sisters and one. I daughter. have four. There was four. There was four. The, my three sisters. Three, three of my sisters entered the Joseph Clooney order, and the girl who worked there, or Margaret Smith, she entered. And four of them died of cancer, which is incredible. I mean, I've heard about one in three. You know, you don't have to ask when they hear about somebody going for tests. But for four out of one house, four girls to die from cancer is extraordinary. Um, but three of those, three of your sisters then became, became nuns. They did. I wonder, did that at all influence the writing of, of that wonderful novella, The Love of Sisters? Oh, the, absolutely. This very tender portrayal I, of nuns. Well, the number of times I visited and got to know, except, of course, that Clooney was an open order. It, 
they were teachers, and there wasn't this extraordinary silence that there was in the poor Clares. Uh, but I knew all about it because we heard plenty of talk about it. And I think the Cistercians are the same, Cistercian nuns. Um, I wouldn't... I wouldn't have written, I, I, I wouldn't have set the opening of that story if I think my sisters weren't nuns and I hadn't such a knowledge of, nu of nunhood, if there is such and, a word. And there's wonderful humanity in, in your portrayal of Martha. the nuns and, and the life in the convent. Yes. And that wonderful nun, yeah. the garden. And yeah, the earthiness and the old lady at the the old lady who's retired and is a doorkeeper and it, 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 the details I it, the details I like a lot I like that book a lot. It's terrific. Based, I think, on was it based on on a short story originally? No, no, it, it was no, it was no, a, it, it came. It was written as a, as as a novella, which I think is nearly my favourite form. Yeah. Uh, it's that, a wonderful form. It is a good form. It's a wonderful form. It's Chekhov, was a Chekhov's favourite form. His, his greatest stories are in novella form. He swore he'd never write a novel, but The Jewel, if you've read it, that's D-U-E-L, is a novel. It's about 150 pages, which I would call a novel, you know. Well, again, I mean, I, I always have this difficulty, I think, how do we distinguish the novella from the novel, because it, I would consider The Love of Sisters to be a novel, a, a short novel. novel. Yes. And uh, maybe that is the definition of a novella. But. Yes, along as a piece of string. It's between, I think a novella is between 20 and 30,000 words. Now, you're, I, I wouldn't be strict about that, but if there was prizes going, I'm sure they would allow a little leeway. Uh, but. It is a wonderful form. It's, 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 it's not daunting. A novel is daunting. A play is terrifying. That's why I've written oh, oh, so few of them. Uh, you know that yourself. I do. <laughs> How difficult it is. <laughs> How terrifying it can be. Yeah. Um, King of the Castle, speaking of plays. Yes. Um, uh, currently in a new production from Druid. Yes. Um, that play, Eugene, uh, you set it in in Leitrim. Yes. Um, but I think the story has its roots. Curiously, people from Leitrim have come up, and I thought they were going to say something nice to me. <laughs> but in <laughs> fact, they were saying, why didn't you set it in your own county? You know what I mean? And in fact, it was set. It came from the Bragan Mountains, which are, which are outside... Um, which run all the way from Carn Rock all the way to Monaghan. And a mountain is reckoned, it has to be a thousand feet. And Carn Rock is 999 feet. And I was always terribly disappointed about that. It didn't actually make the mountain. But it is mountainous country. And that's really the country, that in my imagination is where it was. Why Leitrim, Kavna, I think he, he transported Terry Flynn to somewhere else, I think. Cause you, you, you do that, and there's no point in doing it. Why, why you're not? Better, you're, better be, you're better be like Joyce and be absolutely... I, I mean, in fact, he was at once asked, what was the most important word that he could think of to do with writing? And he said very promptly, accuracy. Now, now for the man who wrote Finnegan's Wake, it's an extraordinary answer. But there must be accuracy also in Finnegan's Wig. Yes, a different kind. But I have to say that King of the Castle could be, you know, the, 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 the truth of it applies as much to Leitrim and the hills and small mountains of Leitrim as to anywhere else in this territory. Or, so I have no or, difficulty with that uh, setting. Yes, or, or, or Kerry or any, anywhere. It's a, it's a pastoral tale. I heard it from a member of the, it doesn't matter that he, he's dead now quite a while, um, of the annulment board of the Clogher Historical, of the Clogher Diocese. And um, I, 
I followed it, the truth of it, which was a man who had done well for himself. And like many men in those days, they had to wait to marry. And he was almost, he was almost too old when he married. And then he was being mocked by his neighbours. And he didn't, that got to him. And somehow he had this brainstorm of an idea which, which ruined him. But in fact it ended that she, very understandably, in the story the way he told me, she left that night and went to her sister's. I tried that ending and it didn't work. It, it, we know she's going. There go me or you, it doesn't matter now. I mean, that, that line is in it. So we know that she's not going to stay on with him. And Gary said, no, absolutely. She had read both of them and she was against the extended ending. This is Gary Hines, leaving. the director of the, the, the yeah. production. Yeah. Because of course there's this great, this great cruelty at work as well. There the is play. cruelty at work. There is. Yeah, there is. Um, and she lies. She lies when, when she says, and maybe he could, when she says, I think she says that to Scober. And then I think she lies, I'm not quite sure how she lies, but she lies about the whole business of not conceiving. What was the response to that play when it was first staged? Well, I can remember I was up at the back of the gaiety and naturally I was in hiding. <laughs> but I still had to end up on the stage. I don't think they do that anymore, do they? No. They, no, they oh, don't, yeah. thanks be yes. to God. No. Um, I remember it was the same then as now. The theatre is largely composed of women. Now, I don't know what the percentage is but women are largely theatre goers. And I, I could see that they were sitting in silence. I could see an occasional man through them laughing because he understood exactly what was going on. And at the end, I couldn't see one of them clapping. Now that was nearly 60 years ago. Mm. Uh, now, whether they'll be clapping this time or not, but I think <laughs> the women of Ireland have grown up a little bit more. <laughs> and the men, and I mean, they're not shockable. Yeah, no. Now, not from what you see on television and stuff. Couldn't be. How did you, how did you learn the art of stagecraft? Did you, did you go to the theatre a lot? Did you read plays? Or did some of that come almost by, by instinct and observation? Well, I did have six months attached to the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow because I was born in Scotland, in the first ten years there, and Guthrie was kind enough to write to the Arts Council and say this lad has been born in Scotland and is entitled to an Arts Council grant. And we got that, which very much helped. And we were there, I was there for six months with Margot and the three children. Or the four children at that time, four children, yeah. Um, but how did I learn it? I was al allowed in to both, it's the equivalent of the Peacock, it was called the Close and the Citizens. And uh, there was one story about that, that it's not relevant to me, but it's, it's, it's relevant to the whole thing of theatre. And Glasgow must have been very offended because, as you know, his grandfather or great-grandfather is in the main street beside Walter Scott, Tyrone Guthrie's. And he was asked along to a very big benefit dinner where he began his speech, which was very brief, by saying he noticed a lot of Rolls Royces outside. And I'm just by glancing around, I can see that the women are bedecked with jewellery. I was at a production, he said, of um, A Midsummer Night's Tale. And it was absolutely brilliant. 
and there were more people on the stage than in the audience. So I would say, culturally, Glasgow is the slum of, of the theatrical world. Well, did he sit down to a silence? A chilly and I, silence, I'd and say. I, and I asked him. He said, I might have had a whiskey too much, but he was utterly indifferent. Utterly indifferent to, to that reaction. And was, he did like to shock. Well, he was telling it like it was, if the, yeah. the, the theatre was empty. That's where quite... The, I mean, the, the, Lord, the, Lord, the Lord Mayor was there with his chains and all the dignitaries and everything. And he was there as the theatre director. And he had worked a lot in Scotland and he loved Scotland. And he was just deeply offended by the fact that they couldn't be bothered going into their only main theatre. I suppose King of the Castle has become your best known play, but there are other fine plays as well, like um, you know, Pull Down a Horseman and Gale Day and the others. And um, I presume it would be, be good to see some of those back in production. I, I would like to... Well, well um, amateurs here put on um, Pull Down a Horseman and they brought that all over the country and I think it did very well for them. And I think I went over to Monaghan with my brother-in-law from Canada and we couldn't get in. The girl at the <laughs> desk didn't know who I was. <laughs> and she said, I'm sorry, sir, it's not even standing room. <laughs> and this was in the courthouse in Monaghan. So obviously people were in interested in the play. Yeah, but professionally it hasn't been done. Hmm since, oh, the late 60s, you know. Uh, a time... Oh, the, a time I know exactly while. when it was done. 66 was a celebration, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 We're here, Eugene, uh, in your house, the farm around, um, and as was like, like McGachran, over the decades you combined the, the life of, of writer and farmer. Yeah. Um, was the farming a source of inspiration for the writing? Not just the land now, but, but the actual physical work of, of working the land. Did that, in turn, at times inspire the words? Now, I wrote Juvenilia, mainly Keatsian poetry. I couldn't call it poetry, I would call it verse, until I suddenly realised I wasn't a poet. And then when I was 20, I was lucky enough to get a story published with David Marcus in Irish writing. Now, I can remember that as being the most exciting acceptance ever. It really meant that somebody like David Marcus and Terence Smith, who was brilliant, that they recognised here is something. And from then on, I thought, well, at that time, we were courting in Cork. She went up to Dublin to be near her both most deaths. And um, at 24 I got married because this farm was here and I had a choice after an arts degree between writing and teaching. And I had no hesitation about which I wanted to do. I had no idea of the slavery of that, especially milking cows. And I went on, sometimes I took a gap. There was a gap. The longest gap was 15 years between writing anything. And it didn't bother me. It, it, people say you, ha you have to keep writing all the time. You know, have to start a novel every year in order to keep the pen on rusty. And I, I simply don't believe that. I think if you can write, you can write. And I picked it up and... I wrote Death of Nightingales long, long after I'd begun writing. And um, Out and Tale and uh, Love of the Sisters, I, I wrote very late in life. Uh, and at the moment I'm writing again a novel and it's always a good sign when you waken up when you have an idea. 
you know it well. When you're involved in something, when you drop something, you think, oh, that's no good, you know. But if you wake up thinking, I know exactly what I'm going to do, or if you go to bed, or Scott Fitzgerald's advice was, always stop when it's going well. Good, because then you know you can go to bed and you'll get up in the morning and you can go on. Um, you learn an awful lot. And Somerset Maugham's Summing Up, I don't know if you've ever read it. It's the best book on writing that I have ever read. It really is brilliant. Now, I know he's regarded as... Well, he made Oh, at his best, he was terrific. I mean, he had three plays running in the West End, and uh, his short stories are... How would you describe them? I don't know. Craft. They are very crafty stories, well-crafted, but not one of them like Chekhov or Maupassant. They're actually jump off the page and you remember them for the rest of your life or seen them. They, they are just clever, crafty stories. And, uh, but he made millions upon millions upon millions out of them, you know. You'd mentioned Chekhov before. Um, You're my patron saint. Good patron saint. I keep going back to Chekhov. If I was anywhere and I'd pick up, I'd pick up a story by Chekhov. i just keep reading. Chekhov and Tolstoy are my two heroes. The thing about Tolstoy is he has no humour. Uh, I've never heard anybody say that. But he, if you think about it, there's immense irony. Immense irony all the way through. But no real humour. Chekhov's bursting with humour. Every chance he gets, there's something in it that makes you laugh, you know. It's really, really good. Little wonderful stabs of humour. That yes, play. yeah, lifts, it lifts it, yeah. And it's in his plays too. And he's not, it's not as if he's poking fun at people. He's actually, he's, he's actually doing what Joyce suggested. He's being accurate. It's one of the first to be really accurate. I mean, Ibsen's plays, he didn't like Ibsen, I know that. And I know why he didn't like them, because... Ibsen took about three years to write a play, and they were crafted, crafted, crafted. Now, Chekhov wrote more quickly. In fact, he kept the family going in a Moscow flat, writing at the edge of a table. Now, can you imagine that, with people all around you and eating the samovar going, and he just wrote these things and sent them off and thought nothing of them because they were funny. Everything he did was funny. It was humour. Until somebody said to him, you know, you're going to do better than this, Anton. And he began to take himself seriously. And then the critics began to take him seriously. And of course, he is, he is the best. Yeah, I think he's one of the best writers in English in the world. In, 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 in the best writers in the world. In, I, we've, I've only read him in translation. Were there books around you when you were a boy? Were there books in the family house? Mm, I have them all here because I didn't want to get rid of them. My mother had about a half a ton of holy books. You know, everything from Padre Pio back, you know, and all of the all of that stuff. And and we're thrusting these books on all of us. Of course, they had a huge influence on the girls. They went into convents, um, but not on me. I couldn't. I had started reading Keats and Yeats and, and Joyce fairly early. And I knew this had nothing to do with, that these books had nothing to do with life. You escaped from out, from the, under the weight of those books. Oh, the way it was. They were. I didn't realise, I didn't realise. You know The Messenger of the Sacred Heart? Mm -hmm. I didn't I know it was a Jesuit publication. I thought it was published by some creep somewhere, you know. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> believe. And then I'm reading it, and it's all the thing, the stuff you hear in, in, at every funeral. They're, they're looking down from above. I mean, and they, why do they keep saying that? When they, I, I think I, I know they can't possibly believe it. Um, maybe 
that would sound shocking to some people because I know I have an Orthodox friend who in fact is a professor and he said very, very clearly, well, I certainly hope to see my parents. But I said, you're older than they are now. You know what I mean? What age are they going to be? And, <laughs> and what do you mean by meeting your parents? What well, he said, they, they come into my imagination and I just, I just want to see them again. That's a very natural thing, but it's not realizable. There's a, a fairly terrifying portrait of, a, of an extremely religious mother in, in your story. There is. Heaven lies about us. There is. Um, and the impact of her ferocious religiosity yes. on her very vulnerable, daughter. sensitive young daughter. Yes. Um, and uh, reading that again recently, and I was reminded of uh, the case of Anne Lovett in Granard, you know, that the image of the grotto. Uh, and You can never pass those two things in Granard. Uh, Collins's last visit to Kitty, his girlfriend, and that on Fort and love it. Yeah. I've never gone I've actually gone up to the grotto, where she. One of the loneliest and saddest things I think that ever happened to this country. I think you know. I th I think it's Noodle Need Donald. Is it? Somebody has written brilliantly about it, a brilliant poem. Oh, yes. Uh, I think Paula Meehan has written about it. And, Who? Uh, I think Paula Meehan has written Maybe about it. Yes. Maybe it's Paula. Maybe um, yeah. it's Paula, yeah. There is a brilliant poem that uh, I read about it. And this was in a way that that marked a certain turning point, I think, yeah. in, in, in Irish society. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, uh, but your story as well, I suppose, explores depths of, of so many, not just uh, uh, extreme religion, but I suppose, uh, cynicism, yeah. Exploitation, sexual abuse, uh, the whole uh, is a fair gamut of. And the uh, fact that it can be in the family. Yes. And people don't know yes. about it. Um, and, and maybe don't know about it until they're years and years older. And uh, and the the wonderful figure as well of uh, the the supposedly simple man, uh, the tramp of a sort, uh, who. Who's, oh yes, who's very kind? Yes, and, and uh, uh, who hovers around? It. I was struck by by that figure as well because it, it, it's similar to uh, a character in in some of McGaffrey's work too. You know the uh, not exactly the wise fool, but the, yeah. the, the person on the edge of society yes. who's an innocent yes. too, um, and and carries so much. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, Eugene, about Death at Nightingales, which you've okay. mentioned. You know, you know, yeah. Your novel from nineteen ninety two. I suppose a novel widely regarded as, as a classic of, of English language literature yes. and, and um, it, it captures so much of place again and prejudice and the hope of love and, and a weight of oppression. Um, what inspired that story of Beth Winters in Fermanagh in 1883? It's dedicated in a second edition to J.C. John Collins, and John Collins was a man who used to come down here and dig the garden. And we were sitting on an, in an April day, I have it written down somewhere, and he looked across, and if, when you go down the avenue you, and you look across the lake, you will see a whole landscape of 30 or 40 acres of marshland and stuff. I kind of changed the setting of that because I put it in Tamana, but when he, t he actually told me the story, that he, the dummy isn't in it, but somebody stopped her and said, I heard two men in there and they're digging and they're digging deep for somebody, you know? And that's the story. Somebody has told me since it's an Irish myth. Now, I've never ever heard it before. And when I heard this, like that, it, it, a bit like King of the Castle, it got into my head and I thought, if that's true, there must be a way of exploring it through writing. So I began to write and like that I woke up every morning and wanted to continue to the end. It grew and grew and grew and uh, 
the end is very, it's like the end of King in the Castle. It's very difficult, but I think it's right now. Oh, it feels, it feels so true yeah. in, in, in reading it. Um, yeah. And, and it, But filmically, it's, it's going to be difficult to do, but they'll get it, I think. It's being filmed at the moment. It's being filmed at the moment, a man called Alan Cubitt, who did The Fall. I don't know if you saw any of I those. did The Fall, it was terrific, yeah. Yeah, well, he wrote the script for it, he casted it. He's, he's very much an all-rounder. But in particular, he wrote the script for it, so he's a good screenwriter. And um, he struggled literally for years till he got exhausted because they kept on trying to compress it. He kept, in the end, he said, it can't be done. You, you know, there's too much left out. So now it's a three-parter. And he's on the part three. And do you know when that might be screened, do you? My wife says she thinks they might be thinking of this spring, but I don't think possibly. I would imagine by the time they get the actors they want and get everything together, it's going to be May. The year after next, yes. The year after next. 20, 2019. Um, but it's, it's already, I, mean, the, I, I remember so many images and pictures from, from that novel. Yes. And this is a quality of your writing. You, you, you make these really strong images, as well as these extraordinary characters who are utterly believable. We're left with these series of images, uh, which are quite cinematic. Yes. And uh, do you have a particular love of, of cinema? I mean, is, is that something that has meant a lot to you over the oh, years? I, I th I th this is interesting because what prompted me, I remember, in a way to start fiddling about with dialogue was Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller with Frederick March playing the lead, which I know Miller disliked intensely. He didn't like that performance. I was completely blown away by that. Now, this was a play, and if you like, it was just a filmed play, but it was so powerful and so true that that, in a way, was um, like a jumping board for me to begin trying to write plays. So that, in a sense, something from, from the screen... Something from the screen prompted me in. to write plays, yeah. Because I knew there wasn't a hope in hell. I mean, nobody writes... Well, people do write screenplays, but, I mean, I wrote 50 or 60 Reardons, I think, but they're not screenplays, you know. <laughs> no, but, they, but they matter, and they're... They ma yes. It's funny I heard Vincent O'Toole, and quite rightly, because they were always neck and neck with the Late Day Show, as far as the time ratings went, and saying that they were very important, because Wesley was shrewd. It's Wesley and Barnes. he was ahead of the times, and he thought... I remember when we gathered around the table, there was a few of us who were writing, and he... I would say, well, you, you're doing the first six or whatever it was. And our theme for this year will be. And he had a theme each time. He lost half the audience and the whole thing when Benji had a tumble in the hay with Maggie. That's right. I, I didn't that. know. I didn't know Ireland was still so serious. He was up there on a pedestal, Benji. And when he did this terrible thing in the hay, that was the end of him. <laughs> <laughs> the end of it. Tom Hickey, who was a wonderful actor, Tom yes, says sir. he still meets people who call him Benji. I mean, yeah. That's the impact yeah. the Reardons had. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, people talk a lot about The Archers, which yeah. is a terrific series on, on BBC Radio 4. Yeah. It's been running, I think, for maybe 60 years. Um, but the Reardons, well, I think, had a profound impact in terms of people looking at their own lives or seeing a reflection of their own lives and how things might change. That's the way soap works, yeah. You, can write, you could write it without... You don't wake up thinking of what I'm going to write next. You just sit down and write it. Uh, I, we, in this house, like Margot and I always called it Benji and the Bus, 
If you remember <laughs> when he was on strike with Tom, he became a bus driver, a school bus driver, and that caused great attention. And I say great humour because everybody understands the school bus. But we always called it Benji and the bus. <laughs> We're very close to the to the border here, Eugene. Yes. Um, and I wonder, you know, and I, of course, the border is now almost the new centre of Europe. Yes. We never thought we'd live to see the day yeah. that it would be the centre of Europe. But um, I wonder, in your observation and experience, has that sometimes visible, mostly unseen political fissure shaped lives and people around here? Well, I think it has. Well, I also had a, a little bit... The way I felt I had to write about the famine, I also felt I had to write. I had to write about what was going on around me. People were saying it to me. Eugene, you live there in the middle of it. You should write about it. And I said, ah, you know, uh, it has let it be distilled and I'll write it afterwards. And um, Then I was given the example of O'Casey writing right those three wonderful rockets uh, that were written at the time. Um, I this is how this is how it became filmed. It's, a, it's an ex- rather weird story. Wesley, because he knew me and because I was doing the reardons, he was in Eason's and he picked up John Ryan's. I think it's was it the Dubliner. It was a high thing, and I had sent him the story of cancer. And Wesley said, I just opened at the beginning and I just kept reading to the end. And I put it down and I'm sorry to tell you, Eugene, I didn't buy it. (laughs) (laughs) But I went back to RT and I said, you have to make this. And then from that, uh, you had again, it's the novella thing. Yes. Another story growing and another story growing, which make a kind of novel, you know. So we got that trilogy. I mean, yeah. I remember seeing those on yeah. on television. Yes. When I was a lad in Leitrim, in yes. probably around seventy seven, I think it might. Have yeah. Been. Uh, and they had a huge impact on me. Yeah. Um, in the the quality of the writing, the quality of characterization, of filming, and again this this confrontation with what was going on around yes. us. Yes. Uh, had it really it was really important for me, I and mean, it it. It was almost like a liberation somehow to see right. to see this on the screen. Okay, um, and I think it was a really important moment in in Irish television as well. Um, in uh, what were you? Uh, in, was your location here important for? Uh, the, absolutely for that. I don't think I could have written it if I wasn't here because. Again, it, there were just little nuggets we heard from a woman who came up to work about a quarrel between a mother and a father about their only son. And they were fighting about the fact that he'd be getting money going in the UDR. And I thought this was incredibly interesting. This makes the whole of heritage. And uh, I thought, what a sad thing. For a lad to have to put on a uniform and go out and stop his neighbours, you know. Um, so that that that's how that second one came, and the third one grew out of that. Victims grew out of that because people were saying you you haven't really yet dealt with the historical. Where did it all come from? It came from the Norman invasion, and it came from the takeover of all the landlords. And I thought. I think it was before. Was he was Sir Robert Strong? He was a speaker in the Northern Parliament, and they, I think they came into his house and they murdered both him and his son, which was a terrible shock. After I'd written the story, you know, and I'd actually met him, I'd met him in Guthrie's. That's very, very, very bland, charming man, you know. Uh-huh. Sometimes literature, art, almost prefigures life. It does, it does, yeah. And and events in in life. Um, 
Another of your stories that I suppose has become quite celebrated is is um, music at Anagol. Our Hollywood. Yeah. And um, Colm Fabian uh, yes. has reads that he's a passionate advocate of your yes. work and and reads that story. Uh, I think it's on the Guardian literary That's website. right. Uh, and I believe his reading of that story has proven more popular than Hemingway. <laughs> that Some girl on the phone told me. Well, I said, long may it last, you know. Because Hemingway, of course, is every writer's hero, you know. I mean, he was a demon for publicity, which is a pity because he didn't have to be. He didn't have to be so. Like, he was such a brilliant writer. Oh, yeah. Until he began to parody himself towards the end. And I think that was drink. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a terrific story. And it, it strikes me again that in that story, there's a kind of broken music, almost literally, yeah. in, in the piano, in that extraordinary image of the, of the, the broken piano yes. that becomes symbolic of, of so much and yet is just itself in a way. Uh, and you get music as well in Death and Nightingales, you know. Yes. Billy Winter is trying to She's pick out the tunes the piano, of the yes. piano. Gork and, Mona, yeah. Mona and Percy do. French in Enniskill yeah. in 1883. Yeah. Um, all that is done, all that was left out, you see. They had to leave it out. If you want to make a film, and again, I'm, I, I should always say a movie, because so many people have said Irish people can't say film properly. We say it, it's F-I-L-L-U-M. Yeah. Film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of film. Um, but the, the music, has music been an inspiration well, to you? Well, my mother had an LR, LRAM, that wouldn't mean a license of the Royal Academy, and she went backstage and met Paderewski, who was then Prime Minister of Poland, because her teacher, a Mr. Duncan, um, was a, a celebrated pianist in Glasgow and was allowed backstage and took his favourite pupil with him. And um, he wanted to hear my mother. My mother sat down and she played. She was about 14 or something at the time. And uh, he said, keep trying. He said, I, but I'm, I wouldn't be so sure. I wouldn't be so sure about being a concert pianist. But she practiced and practiced and practiced and did what they say, six hours a day. But she could not just reach that standard. And she went on and became a school teacher. Uh, so that mu did music. When she in fact was suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia, I don't know which, and didn't know, and who are you, dear? This is to me. And she'd talk nonsense. And then I'd say, could you play us a tune? She could sit down on note perfect. She could play Chopin and Mendelssohn and all, all the things, easy stuff, easy listening that, that she loved and that we all loved, you know. Uh, so music was, the house was filled with music. And our, it was there, our, our, our music. It was there still in her, late on in her... Core, it was I there guess. when she was gone. So I asked about this. I remember asking some psychiatrist about it. And he said, that, that, the music comes from the spine. It doesn't come from the brain or the fingers or the heart. It comes from the spine. Now, I don't understand that. But anyway, that's what he told me. Do great. you understand it? No, but it's no. a great image. It's a very striking <laughs> yes. thought. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, I know when David Marcus got his stroke, uh, he wrote to me a few times, and it was kind of gibberish, and he said, excuse me, I know I'm, you know, but Isa said, just send it the way they are. But he said, I can play the piano perfectly. It's interesting. Um, there's something again in the work at times... Uh, and it, especially in, in that story that Thabine reads, that reminds me of, of Kavanagh's The Great Hunger. You know, yes. the, as was the, these bitter, wasting I lives was, of I, unmarried I was, and I am a huge admirer of Kavanagh. I mean, I would prefer to read Kavanagh, and Kavanagh would stick in my mind more than just 
some very beautiful images in Yeats. He's not a more important poet, I know that, but he, to me, he is hugely important. I think he, I, I think I said somewhere, uh, Cav, um, Cav, I, th I thought somebody else, I thought I was quoting somebody else, I, and then I discovered in another piece that I was quoting myself, Kavna is Monaghan. You know, it, it, that's how I put it. Oh, uh, yeah, he was yeah, 50 he was. years yeah. uh, in November since, yeah. his, since he died. And, yeah. uh, and he, he, I go back to him all the time. And, and he's he still the same. Still the same. He, he answers for all of us in the country. I mean, the, was the closing, the last lines of it are just heartbreaking, you know, when you think of the anonymous life these people led and were just dropped into their graves, you know, unsung, forgotten. No, I think he did a wonderful thing in that. I mean, I know that he, sailing to Byzantium and, and, and all the great poems of Yeats are superb, but um, that great hunger is, is an epic masterpiece of pastoral life. I don't think it. I mean, maybe, maybe McGarn's uh, that they shall face the rising sun is pretty close to it. It's it, it's funny that I thought of 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 writing a novel set, a pastoral novel set in Ireland, and like it was next week, it appeared in the bookshelves. <laughs> McGarn had written it. Yeah. So so we both. We were both obviously very influenced by the all the all the daily work and and, and and working through working through people, you know. In the King of the Castle, it's there. I know it's very cruelly there uh, with the with the country people. Uh, the whole pastoral effect of living amongst people who have some of them have never been to Dublin, you know. And uh, I can slip into dialect very easily. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene, this year's um, Iron Mountain Festival has themes, broad themes, I suppose, of, of borders, migration, yeah. and history. And it, it strikes me that those themes and strands run through your work. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the migration that brought the mix of people that we have around here yeah, uh, and the new wave of migration that's changing it again and the border beside us and the land and uh, and the history that, that is, again, I around mean, the, us, that we the live first, within. McCabe is the most, I think it's the third most common name in Cav and the sixth in Monaghan and there isn't a mention of a McCabe till 1400. We came here as hired mercenaries with huge axes it's the axis, the two axes crossed. I mean, we were, a, well, judging from, my, judging, from, judging from my father's family, big men. <laughs> and I have a grandson who's six foot six in proportion, you know. Physically, big men. I'm an, I, my, I, I get my size from my mother. My mother always described herself as a bantam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I wonder if literature is to have any particular role. Um, does it have a role, in a sense, in reminding us of history? You know, of the complexity of history, and also the, I suppose, the deeply individual stories within it, and maybe then it holds the possibility of helping us to reach across borders and, and find a, a common humanity with those who are different to us. Well, in the back, in the back, in the back of the Bloomsbury edition, there was, um, I can't think of him, he was a prison guard, a screw they call him, there was a screw who read Night, Death and Nightingales and he said it had changed his whole outlook to Catholics and the South. And when the editor read this, and he read this comment from this man, he thought, we have to publish this. 
So that, that, that is, that's history. And that's literature influencing a man's thinking. You know, he's reading a novel, he knows it's a novel, he knows it's all invented, but there you are. Would you read a poem for us? I could give you, I think, off the cuff. Better again. Yeah. Um, let's ignore the curlew's lament. Now mind the brown hawk motionless above the wood in broken light. The lake a silver blind, below that single yew that's long withstood the storms that hurl and howl from listener row to strip the beach and fill the yard with ghosts, invoicing us of what we owe to time. Now winter's marching round Ramard, we log up stoves against the coming cold. Much to live for, still more to, to remember and try to never talk of growing old. Light in November can catch the glory of summer's past, and though God gives no sign, when love is all, there is no final line. Eugene McCabe, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah. Eugene, let's, let's hear Ruth again uh, reading from music at Anne Huggian. Teddy said you remarked a piano at Foster's. Oh God, Annie thought and said, I saw it from the road. Leah met another scone before he said, scrap. I'd say, whole place was read out at the sale. Piano must have been laying about in a pig house or some of them old rotten lofts. That's what Teddy said, a dud. He right about that anyway. And that's that, Annie thought. Soon they'd all be pensioned. Maybe then she could buy the odd thing. It was up to her to run the house on the milk check. It could be a very small one in winter. She made up by crocheting anything but approach Liam. All afternoon she thought of the piano. In the end she found herself crying as she needed bread. Here I got, she thought, I'm going astray in the head, an old scrap piano, not a body in the house fit to play. And here I am all snivels over the head of it. She blew her nose and put it out of her head. It was dark when Teddy got back. He smelled of whiskey and fags and his eyes looked bright. Liam didn't look up from the Anglo-Celt. Your dinner's all dried up, Annie said. No odds, Teddy said. Liam switched on the wireless for the news. They all listened. When it was over, Teddy said, I saw your piano. I made a deal for it. Oh, you're caught in, Teddy. It's out of tune. Well, that's easy fixed. Woodworms in the back. You can cure that too. There's a pedal off. What odds? From the way Liam held the paper, she could tell he was cut. God's sake, couldn't he let on for once in his life? His way of showing he kept the deeds. Teddy winked. Who sold it? Liam asked. Right, the auctioneer. It was forgot at the sale, hid under a heap of bags in the coach house. Cute boy, right? He's all that. How much? Two notes, he gave it away. You paid him? He's paid. That's all right, Liam said and went out. They heard him rattling buckets in the boiler house. <laughs>